Hello and welcome to your THP online community. I am Dallas, your online community pastor. Today, Pastor Scott is continuing our series, The Path, with a message called Fruitful Living Part 3. We hope that this message not only encourages you, but challenges you. We firmly believe that the things spoken here on Sundays and Wednesdays are not just for those who are able to join us, but also for members of our THP online community. Uh, We've been talking about the path, and we've been talking about the narrow path that is set before us. We've been reading Matthew chapter 7 the last few weeks um, that expressed that there is a gate that is entered in to begin to walk into a path. And there are two paths. There's, there's two paths. There's a narrow path and then there's a broad path. There is a narrow path that few find their way. And then there's a broad path where the crowds are going through. And there is a gate that leads to that path or a door that leads to that path, and that door is Jesus. We know that. We know that Jesus said, I am the door. I am the door. I am the way that you come into this thing. He is the way and the truth and the life. Amen? Like there's, It's through Jesus, and he gave us access to all of the things that God has promised. And then last week, we we said yes to the I am because we were talking about the, the fruit of the Spirit is, the fruit of the Spirit is. What is the fruit of the Spirit, and how do we stay connected? How do we bear that fruit? How does that come out of our life? And we talked about that, and we talked about the importance of abiding in the vine, staying in the vine, and that Jesus is the vine. He's the source of everything, amen? Like, he is the vine, and so we, we talked about abiding in Christ and remaining in him. And we said yes to fruitful living last week. And in Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. What's he saying? Well, your profession needs to line up with your walk. What you're declaring with your mouth needs to line up with what you're doing. I mean, that's what he's telling us. He's saying, you know, don't don't just say this, but, but do this. Don't just be hearers only, but doers. And it says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, uh, provoking one another, envying one another. And so he said, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of being filled with the Holy Spirit, you get on this path, you're walking on the narrow path. Jesus, um, Jesus sent us a comforter and a counselor, one who would be our guide and show us the way, and he would lead us in the narrow path. And that's why it's so important for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's why it's so important for us not to be filled with the things of this world, but to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Everybody say filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, it even sounds good, right? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Not filled with garbage or trash or anything like that, but filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we've been given this comforter and this counselor, and as we're filled with the Holy Spirit, then what begins to come out of our life? Well, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, what begins to come out of our life is love, right? And joy. By the way, it's so good to see joy today. (laughs) Right? Whew. Peace. Is there anybody named Peace here today? I'm just checking before I move on. Just want to make sure. Like there's some really awesome things that come out of our lives. And even when it comes to the part of long suffering, like that doesn't sound good. It, it, it sounds like suffering long. No, that's talking about you're patient in all of that. You're willing to walk through that. Why? Because you're not walking through it alone. You're filled with the Holy Spirit, right? So no matter what comes against you, like these things, as you're filled with the Holy Spirit and kindness and goodness and all of this stuff, gentleness and self-control, all this amazing stuff starts coming out of our lives. Why? Because we are good? Because we are joyful? Because we're loving? No, because a loving God gave his only begotten son and his only begotten son then sent another one to fill us. That's why all of this stuff can come out of our lives. 
And that God's will and his desire for our lives is fruitful living. He wants us to bear fruit. He wants us to, to, to do these things every single day, to discover and to grow every single day. That's God's will and God's desire for our lives. And we learned last week that abiding in Christ is the key to being fruitful to being filled with all the resources hidden in Christ. And another key that we learned was a key that maybe we don't like. And that is the pruning of our lives by the Father. How many of you have ever been pruned by the Father, right? You ever been cut back a little bit and pruned? How many of you know that it's not always an awesome thing? But here's the great thing about God. Even though it may not feel awesome, it's always for your benefit. Although it may hurt a little, it's always for your betterment. It's always so that you will grow. Why does God prune us? God prunes us so that there'll be more love coming out of our lives, more joy, more peace, more long suffering, more goodness, more self control. He prunes us so that those good things can come out of our lives and not just bear some fruit like we talked about last week, but more fruit. And even beyond that, fruit that remains. Man, I'm so thankful like for Tanya and I that, that we can see li a little bit of fruit in our lives, but now with our children, we begin to see fruit that remains. Then when grandchildren come, now listen, go back to podcasts. I have not said anything about this in a long time. I have been faithful, but today I'm stepping out by faith. What is it about grandkids that changes everything? What is it about grandchildren that changes it all? Because it's not some fruit. It's not more fruit. It's fruit that remains. You know what? When we look at our children, who do we see? We see ourselves. But when we look at our grandchildren, we don't see ourselves. We see them as themselves. Come on. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You go all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Isaac is the son of promise. But yet Jacob is the one who ends up fulfilling the covenant. The grandchild does. Why? Because it went beyond one generation. When it goes beyond one generation, we begin to see that it's not just some fruit for a period of time, but it's lasting. It remains. You know, you can see that in so many cultures as it has to do with generations. You can see it in the Jewish culture if you ask some of the Jews who went through the Holocaust, and I've heard it out of their own mouth sitting across from a table. How do you deal with, with, with getting the, the Nazis back? How do you deal with the revenge aspect of it? And almost unequivocally, their answer is the same. Grandchildren. Why? Because when our grandchildren came, we knew that whatever they tried to do to us, they couldn't do really to us because it kept going and the story would still be told. Come on. Like, like, that's the fruitfulness that God wants for our lives. Listen, you may come from a background where you didn't have Christ in the equation. Maybe your parents didn't read the word of God. Maybe they didn't pray with you. Maybe they didn't take you to church, whatever it is. And, and you begin to walk this path. Listen, it doesn't stop with you. It started with you. And you got to tell it to the next so that they'll tell it to the next. We've had too many generational gaps where one group, because of whatever, whether it was, whether it was uh, Uber law or maybe it, whatever it was, got, got messed up and hated this and hated church and hated this and hated God. And then it skipped a generation. And then all of a sudden this generation has to, has to clean up for everything that happened. Listen, we need to pass it from generation to generation to generation. Why? So the story can be told. My story? No, his story. So the story can be told. Some of you are here today because the story kept being told. Listen, if you were raised in church all your life, I want to say this the right way. Don't listen to those of, that would say, oh, I can't believe you've been raised. Oh, it's so much better if you just would have been a drug addict until you were 30 and then got saved. Really? Really? Oh, you were raised, we almost have made that a negative. That is not a negative. 
You were raised up in faith. You heard the word of God. You were taught the word of God. That is a blessing, not a curse. People make it a curse by their own actions, not by anything that God did. That's the fruit that we're after that remains. And God does it by pruning. A fruitful person is growing and increasing and producing and reproducing. John 15, verse 1 says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, listen, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Why? That it may bear more fruit. God doesn't prune us to take anything away from us. God prunes us so that more can come from us. Do you notice we always go to the negative? It's almost like we scream at a world about what we're against, but we never tell them what we're for. We want to yell at everybody what we're against, and sometimes what we're against is not even really about the Bible and what's holy and righteous. It's just about our opinion. And that's how a lot of times ears get put off to what we're trying to say because we're not pointing, him, we're not pointing them to him. Sometimes we're just pointing them to our opinion. We need to point them to him. Amen? Because that's where the fruit comes. And in John 15, he, he talks about these, these, these three keys, which is like the vine dresser. Our father, the vineyard owner who works the vineyard and watches over it with great care and faithfulness. How many of you know that God loves you? Wow, there's a few of us today. Like if you don't know, let me just tell you today, God loves you. Not because I say it, but because the word of God says it. God loves you. God's not against you. God's for you. He hates what we do sometimes. I mean, the word of God is clear. These things the Lord hates. Oh, the Lord doesn't hate anything. The word of God says he hates some stuff. Feet that are swift to run to evil. God hates that. A wicked heart. God hates that. God does. He doesn't love that. Why? Because it's counterintuitive to who he is, his character and his nature. It's counterintuitive to the fruit of the spirit. It's a work of the flesh. That's even what Galatians talks about, the works of the flesh. So God is this vine dresser. But then it talks about the pruning, which is removing hindrance to fruit bearing, cutting away the old, the unnecessary. But we said this last week. God does it in a way that's very skilled. God doesn't come in with an ax and just start flailing away at your life. If you're sensing that, that's probably the enemy and not God. Because God's very skilled at what he cuts away. Why? Because he doesn't want to hurt you. He loves you and he wants it to be for your benefit. So he doesn't want to cut away that which needs to remain. But the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. He flails away at us. But when God comes to prune us, he knows exactly where to go. Sometimes we get upset with people because they don't have the prophetic word. We say, well, they're not, they're not of God. They didn't know exactly what to say. Listen, if you lie to somebody, that doesn't not make them a prophet. That makes you a liar. There's a lot of people in the kingdom. This astounds me. It blows my mind. There's a lot of people in the kingdom that say they're a part of the body of Christ who lie just to try other people. You're a liar. And if you continue to lie, you will have a place. The Bible's clear. It doesn't mean anything about that person that you're trying to catch in whatever you're trying to catch him in. It makes you a liar. See how the enemy works? He, he tries to, why is he trying to do that? Because he's trying to get us away from the vine. He's trying to separate us from abiding in the vine so that the vine dresser can take care of us, so that we can be pruned with a skillful pruning. The branches... Believers whose, whose growth depends on the vine. Jesus, the source. John 15 said, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Vine dresser means one who has care of the vineyard, who nurtures, who trims, who defends. God cares for the branches and he deals with each one according to his will. 
Did you know that it's not our job to deal with someone's salvation or non-salvation? It's God's job to take care of that. Well, they're just not getting right. Well, if they're not getting right and they're not allowing him to prune them, it's not your job to prune them. Because they're a branch and you're a branch. You're not the vine, nor are you the vine dresser. (laughs) We are not the vine or the vine dresser. We're branches. Yes, we can tell another branch, hey, you may not want to do that. (laughs) Right? But we're not the ones that end up judging it all at the end. So many times I think we forget that we are branches and we're not the vine, nor are we the vine dresser. Isaiah 27 says, in that day, sing to her, a vineyard of red wine, I, the Lord, keep it. He says, I, the Lord, keep it. I water it every moment, lest any hurt it. I keep it day and night. He said in this passage, I I keep the vineyard. I, I water it. Why? So that no one else will hurt it. That he keeps it day and night. Why does he keep it night and day? Because in the day, normally there's a lot of activity, but a lot of times the enemy comes at night. And he comes to sneak in and to steal and to kill and destroy. Aren't you glad that God doesn't just protect us during the day, but he protects us in the nighttime? (laughs) God knows us and he loves us unconditionally and we cannot earn it, escape it, or erase it. 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. Jeremiah 31, three, the Lord appeared of old to me. And here's what the Lord said. Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Sometimes we think that loving kindness is just, you know, God's going, hey, you know, a lot of times loving kindness is that pruning painful part, but he's doing it because he has loving kindness. Right? Romans 8 Verse 38 and 39, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Matthew 7, 11, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father, will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Pruning is the Father's love in action. It literally is an action on his part that shows you how much he loves you. And pruning removes the individual unfruitful branches. Why does this pruning remove the unfruitful branches? So that that unfruitful branch will not infect the whole thing. The vine dresser must know when to cut and how much to cut. That's why he's the vine dresser and we're not. (laughs) He knows when to cut and how much to cut. If I, was to, if I was to cut, I might not know when to cut, and I may cut too much. Or maybe I wouldn't cut enough just because I didn't want to go through the pain myself, right? right? Pruning stimulates growth, and it makes room for new fruit. It's, it's what we've been talking about for the, for the last year. It's not about position or title or this or that. It's about you looking at it and going, you know what? Man, if I would just slide to the side, that's going to make room for maybe one, two, three, four people who are sitting in the shadows who think just because I'm doing this that they can't do what God's called them to do. But if you would just slide to the side and step into what God has for you, it makes room for these people. God prunes us to stimulate growth. And the vine dresser cuts away. Why? So the quality of the crop is not jeopardized. He disciplines. Why? He disciplines because of his goodness. He disciplines because of his great love for us. God is for us and not against us. And he always prunes us in love. Proverbs 3.12. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects. Just as a father, the son in whom he delights. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects. Hebrews 12, 11. Now no chastening seems to be joyful. Can I get a witness on that? Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. How many of you were just like, God, why, why, why? This hurts, it's horrible, it's terrible. But once you get past that point, you're like, wow, I get it now. Anybody live like that? Like, 
wow, I don't understand why this is happening. But then you get it on the other side, and now it's not a testimony of how bad you feel. It's a testimony of how God, good God was. Amen. That's why we need to be careful not to curse God in the storm, because God will bring us through the storm, and it will become a testimony of his goodness. Amen. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. That's the word of God. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Why did he say to those who have been trained by it? Because a lot of times we don't allow him to teach us through it because we hate it so much. And thereby we end up doing it again because we didn't learn from it the first time. We kind of keep going around the mountain over and over again, right? Why? Well, uh, flesh, <laughs> humanity, right? We like to do what we want to do. We like what we want rather than sometimes what we need. And when we act like that, who are we acting like? We're acting like little children, right? When we train our kids, what happens? They hate it when it's happening. They rail against us. They even say things that we hate, like, I wish I had another mother. Well, Jimmy's dad does this, and he lets them do this, and he lets them do that. Well, praise God. You ain't doing it because you ain't Jimmy's dad's kid. Come on. And you're not an orphan. You're a son and a daughter. And by the way, I'm not going to go to the default and go, oh, just go to Jimmy's dad and he'll raise you. It's not Jimmy's dad's job to raise you. It's my job to raise you. And when I raise you to a certain point and you're ready to go, you can go and then anybody can be anything they want to. But as long as you're here, my responsibility is to raise you up. Raise me up what? To raise you up to bear fruit. Well, how do I do that, dad? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Go through the door. Abide in the vine. Right? Be filled with the Holy Spirit and you will bear fruit. You know, there are some reasons for unfruitful branches. The first one is pretty simple. Maybe not something we want to hear, but sinfulness. You know, Romans 8, 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. One of the reasons for unfruitful branches is sinfulness, like ongoing sinfulness, a pattern of behavior of sinfulness. If you're in a pattern of behavior of sinfulness, repent, like turn from it. Secondly, maybe, you know, as important because of what it leads to, hindrances. Hebrews 12, therefore also since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Sometimes the reason why we're unfruitful is just because of hindrances. Things that we allow. Listen, here's how we keep away from getting offended by people and at people. That person is not your hindrance. You allowing that person to be the hindrance is the hindrance. Well, we always want to blame somebody else. We're, while we're blaming somebody else, we're being drained of the Holy Spirit. And that's why love's not coming out and peace is not coming out and joy's not coming out and long suffering. Why? Because we now have given someone control over our own behavior. And we begin to step outside of our identity in Christ. Three, man, one of the, one of the keys for our generation, distractions. And when I say generation, I'm not talking about millennials. So I didn't say that today. Don't quote me on that. I said our generation. Who am I talking about? Everyone who is alive right now. Because it's not just millennials that are distracted. I go to restaurants and I see 50 and 60 year old couples staring at their phones instead of one another. And sometimes they're doing it because they did everything for their kids and they worship their kids and they didn't even know who they were and they were roommates for 18 years raising children and once the children were gone they didn't have anything in common. That ain't happening to this couple right here. I love my kids, but they gone. And this is good. Why is this good? Because we didn't worship our children. We told them yes when it was appropriate, and we told them no when it was appropriate. And we told them, no, we're not talking to you right now, and you're not going to distract us right now because we're going to have our time. Well, that's hard. 
Well, listen, I'm not bragging. Maybe I am bragging. I don't care anymore. My kids turned out pretty good. Man, I'm tired of preachers feeling sorry about their kids. My, my kids turned out well. And if they turned out bad, I tell you, they turned out bad, but I love them. <laughs> and I'm going to declare what they aren't. Come on, I'm going to declare what they are, even if they aren't. Come on, right? We told them no, and I think it turned out okay. Now, once the grandkids come, <laughs> I'm just saying, I don't, I don't know how that's going to turn out. It might be yes all the time. I don't know, but. <laughs> oh, chocolate for breakfast. Hallelujah. <laughs> We're going to load the table with gluten and sugar. Let's do it. Come on. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Distractions, sorry, <laughs> distractions. <laughs> looking unto Jesus, the main thing. Why do we look unto him? Because he's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the beginning and the end. That's why we, our focus is on him. Why? Because for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We can end up growing a long, beautiful vine with lush leaves that looks good to everyone else but has no fruit because it is not of God. Bad habits. Habit, pattern of behavior accepted through repetition. It's actually an action that we perform so often it just becomes an involuntary response. If it's undesirable, we call it a bad habit. I love what Coach Tom Landry said. He said, the job of a football coach is to make men do what they want to do in order to achieve what they've always wanted to be. To make men do what they don't want to do to achieve what they want to achieve. It's what we do to our kids. We, we raise them and we, we, we point them in a direction to do certain things that they don't want to do. Why? Because of the expected outcome, because of what God's word says. And the last point, excuses. Luke chapter 14, verse 18. I, I love the layout of this parable. The master of the feast is preparing this amazing feast. He tells his servant to go out and invite those who have been invited. These aren't uninvited guests. They are the invited guests, right? Right? the ones who are supposed to be at this feast. And it says in, in Luke 14, but they all with one accord began to make excuses. I have bought a piece of ground that I must go and see it. Listen, I'm not buying a piece of ground unless I've already seen it. <laughs> one guy's excuse is he's married, that's it. It says they began to make excuses. And when the servant comes back and says, hey, all those we invited, they just began to make excuses. He said, forget them. Go to the highways and the hedges and compel them. He didn't say invite them. He said, compel those who haven't been invited, compel them to come. We spend so much time inviting those who have already been invited that we for forget to compel those who never got invited. How do we compel them? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when they see love and joy and peace, and when they see that fruit of the Holy Spirit coming out of your life, guess what? It's going to compel them to come. I remember preaching a, a, a series called Stop Inviting People to Church. People went nuts. They were, they were mad at me and all this. And my point was, we keep inviting people either that are already in another church and we invite people that we're comfortable inviting, but we don't go and compel by our behavior and our attitudes those who have never been invited. Listen, invitations are important. They are, but sometimes we put all of our witness and our testimony into an invitation rather than just living out the expression of what's happening inside. Pruning involves adversity, trials, testing, and I don't know about you, but I would just like to say sometimes to adversity, trials, and testing, go away. Right? 
Cal gone? Take me away. But God wants us to say, bring it. Oh, I would never say bring it. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you're abiding in the vine, it doesn't matter what trial comes. You know you can get through it. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, you don't have to fear evil. Why? Because he's with you. Bring it. Oh, I would never say that. Bring it. Listen, the devil has no authority over you as you are in Christ. Bring it. A lot of people in the body of Christ won't even read Job because they're afraid of what will happen to them. Alfred de Souza said, for a long time it had seemed to me that life was about to begin, real life. But there was always some obstacle in the way, something to be got through first, some unfinished business, business, time still to be served, a debt to be paid, then life would begin. And at last it dawned on me that these obstacles were my life. <laughs> we have this whole teaching thing about you're never gonna go through anything if you receive Christ. Lie. If you never go through anything, why do you need Christ? If you're never going to get sick, why do you need a healer? Oh, I know that messes with some people's theology, but you don't need a healer if you're not sick. <laughs> you don't need to be free if you're free, right? And sometimes I think that in this fruitful living, there are a couple things that we just, well, I'll just avoid it. Listen, avoiding is not going to help you be fruitful. And actually avoiding any problem or issue, it's not going to make it go away. It's actually going to make it a lot worse most of the time. Well, maybe I can just survive it. Well, listen, surviving is stopping short of all God has for you. Well, listen, I'm coping with it. Listen, I hear all these all the time. I'm coping with it. Listen, yes, coping can be done, but it's still just coping and not changing. Well, listen, I'm trying to manage it all. Listen to me. Speaking from experience, managing will drain you. And it is a full-time job, and it will give you no hope for the future. But responding that's when you decide to embrace the cutting away of the old, new fruitfulness, taking the next step, abiding in the vine, don't let the devil win, respond to adversity, hardships, setbacks, challenges. Don't react with make it go away. Respond with bring it. <laughs> Why? For we know that pruning is gonna bring some fruit, more fruit, and if we hold on, fruit that remains. That's all I got for you today. Well, in the message today. Would you stand just for a moment? We're not just gonna pray this way today because we have a meeting afterwards. I, I really felt like the Lord gave us that beginning to our time together for a purpose. That people that would have needed that come forward in prayer came forward <laughs> right off the bat. I was just like, man, I have a need. I've got to get this. I've got to get this, this, this. I sometimes I almost hate saying negativity because then we almost make it a, a positivity thing. And it's not a positivity thing. It's about not believing and declaring the things the enemy has said over us, but believing and declaring the things that God has said over us. That's what it is. It's not just positive confession. I mean, I can look in the mirror all day and say, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. The moment she walks in the bathroom, she's going to be like, you're not good. I love you more than life itself, but you're not good. Thank you, honey, for the encouragement. I appreciate you. But God is good. And the man you're looking at in the mirror, God created in his own image. So stop wallowing in self-pity. Stop wallowing in false humility, which at its root is pride. And just accept who you are in him and begin to declare that. That's pruning, <laughs> right? But that's why we need it. That's why we need it. Whew. 
Lord, we just, uh, we just thank you for your word today. God, we thank you for the opportunity to take a moment with people that we love to just, not just acknowledge you, God, not just to acknowledge your existence or your presence, but to truly declare it, to raise our voices and to lift up our hearts and create an anthem today that says you are the God of miracles. That you are the God who was and who is and who is to come. And so, Lord, right now, we come to you. And, Lord, as our response to the word today, God, we come, maybe some of us are withered. We're that withered branch. Maybe we feel like we've even been cut off. God, maybe we come today and we've been singed by the fires of this world and that branch is just barely holding on. Maybe we come today and we've seen some fruit, but we know there's more. God, maybe we're here today and maybe we've seen the more, but maybe the remaining we haven't seen yet. Lord, bring us back in tighter. Abiding in the vine. Connected to the vine. Abiding, remaining in Christ. And Lord, I don't just pray healing for all of us today. That we would just be better. But I pray that as we tighten up, as we stay connected to the vine, that we wouldn't just be good, but we would be holy. We would be righteous. The fruit of righteousness. Because we would allow you to train us and teach us. And we wouldn't shut you off like a high schooler in chemistry class. Because, <laughs> Lord, we know that sometimes we do act like that. We do act as if we know what you're saying, but we don't receive what you're saying. But, Lord, we don't want to live that way anymore. My sheep know my voice. And, Lord, if we are in you and abiding in you, we are your sheep. And we will know your voice. And so to those that feel like they're barely hanging on today, I want every head bowed and every eye closed. And those of you that know me know that I don't do this often. But I believe it's necessary today. Every head bowed, every eye closed. You're here today and you're like, I'm barely hanging on, Scott. I am. I'm just barely hanging on. And I, I haven't been sure that I can come back to get ingrained into that vine, abiding in Christ. So if that's you today, you feel like you're barely hanging on, just lift your hand right now. You're barely hanging on, lift your hand. Don't be ashamed, just lift your hand, it's fine. You're barely hanging on today. In the name of Jesus, those that raise their hands, Lord, I pray that God, what you've spoken to them today, what you've declared over them today would bring them in closer to the vine. God, I pray today that they would be encouraged that although it's a process, there is hope for those diseased branches. It may take seasons, but Lord, it is possible. And you do desire for those branches to be healthy again. <laughs> it's called restoration. <laughs> and you are a restorer of the broken people. You are a restorer of the broken places and you are a rebuilder of that which has been torn down. And so Lord, I pray for an infusion of hope in their life today. And I pray that they would take their next step, Lord, of being faithful in your word, being faithful to communicate with you every day, Lord, to be faithful to position themselves, to listen and to hear. And as they hear, to not be hearers only, but doers of your word. Encourage today in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Thank you so much for taking time to listen to this message. 
if this message has challenged you or has ministered to you in a very real way and you would like for us to pray with you or maybe you want to share a testimony about what God has done in your life, feel free to email us at mediahub at thpstreetport.com or you can also contact us through all of our social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for The Healing Place or THP Shreveport. Also, don't forget that if you'd like to support the ministry that takes place here at The Healing Place, you can visit our online giving page found at thpshreveport.com. Thank you so much for being part of our THP online community.